Father God, Lord, we thank you today for the opportunity we have to be here. We thank you today to know that you brought us here. Lord, we ask right now that you would meet us right where we are, that you would have your way from start to finish throughout this service, uh, that not one of us will leave this place the same way we came in. Lord, we know that uh, this hour you have a word for us. May we not miss it. May we not be distracted. May, may our minds not wander. May we absorb this moment. Lord, we ask that you would just anoint my vocal cords that it be your words, not of mine. <coughs> and Lord, that uh, we would in this place feeling differently than when we came in. We pray these things in your holy, your precious and mighty name, knowing they shall be done. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Uh, today we continue uh, what looks to be uh, roughly a five-part a five-part series in the book of Ruth. We just finished up the book of Esther, and we are uh, we are talking about this idea of the road ahead. Now, every one of us, we we, are, we always have a road in front of us. Some of these roads are a little swirly. Some of these roads go left. Some of these roads go right. Some of these roads are pretty smooth. Uh, some of these roads are a little rough. How many of you feel like you're on a rough road right now? You need a little alignment in the vehicle or something. But I, I, I sometimes look at the world and I feel like we've lost our mind. And I wonder, is this road going to get any smoother? The Bible says it's not It's not going to get smoother, is it? It's actually going to get a little rougher. Um, but we've got to navigate through it. And, and God gave us his word. And these words have been written for thousands of years. It's a living, breathing thing. Every time you go into it, it ministers to you differently, and as we are studying this book once again, I know for me, uh, it has been roughly seven years since I have opened the book of Ruth, and so it's just, it's fresh, it's new, um, and it's jumping off the pages. Each week has been different uh, today. I think today we've got two many sermons in one. I think that there's going to be one sermon right here, and then some of you are going to check out, and we'll see you next week. And then there's going to be another mini-sermon that follows, and you're like, that, that's why I came. And so whichever one, you know, it's meant for you, maybe it's both, um, don't miss it. Let me get, get, get you called up. You haven't missed much. We just began looking at the life of Ruth. And we've been seeing God work behind the scenes, like he always does in every situation. Last week we met a family a four that, uh, that moved to a, a perverse town, a place called Moab. They had to leave Bethlehem um, because there was a great famine in the land. And so we had a husband and a wife and her two boys. They moved to this place called Mo uh, uh, Moab. When they get there, um, life kind of falls apart uh, for this lady by the name of Naomi. Uh, she was the mom. She was the wife. Her first, her husband dies. And then her two boys die. Uh, not not so good. Before the two boys died, they married two Moabite ladies, ladies from the town that they were in. This is the first nation, this godly, godless this nation. Um, these ladies, their names were Orpah and, and Ruth. Um, and so she's left Naomi without her husband, without her two sons, and she's left with two daughter-in-laws. Many ladies, does that sound lovely? I mean, if, I, you know, if you're a daughter-in-law, some of you know it's hard enough to get through dinner with your mom, mother-in-law, much less moms. Uh, if you have daughter-in-laws, you know sometimes they can be high maintenance, right? No? Some of you, some of you are just on your best behavior. That's okay. So that's what they're left with. Well, Naomi gets word that things are hopping back in Bethlehem. And so she's going to go back to her town. But before she does... She calls her daughter-in-laws together, and she says, Orpah, she says, Ruth, look, girls, you're still young. You still got it. You can still get a man. In and, 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 and this day, they, they needed a man. I mean, a widow without the support of a man, they didn't, have, they didn't have much chance. And so she says, girls, you need to get it together, and you need to get out there, and you need to find yourself a man. And Orpa says, you ain't got to tell me twice. She was already at Macy's getting her makeup and dress and going out there to work. Uh, Ruth does the exact opposite. She looks at Naomi and says, I'm not leaving. We are in this together. She, she's like just the two of us. If Will Smith had already heard that song, she'd be singing it. We can make it if we try, just the two of us. You and I. Some of you have no clue what I'm referencing. <laughs> and if you don't, that, that's okay. The ones that we can do get it. She says, till death do us part. And so, 
that that's that's pretty much your call up. I hope you I hope the story makes sense. Let's read verse 22 because we're going to wrap up chapter one. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, returned with her uh, from the country of Moab. It specifically says that again. And they came to Bethlehem at the begin and the beginning of barley harvest. Now, as we conclude. The, the first chapter, as we are bringing this together, we need to note some things. The Bible says that when they come back to Bethlehem, it is the beginning of harvest season. There are, there are a couple things that stand out as we close chapter 1 and now enter chapter two, uh, chapter 2. Verse 22 makes two things very clear. The first is this. The author wants you to know that Ruth is a Moabite lady. It's like, don't forget this. Don't forget that, that that's, the tables have turned. That's what the Bible is trying to show us here. We were talking last week about how circumstances change. You're going to see this week after week, something that you and I need to be reminded of all the time. Our circumstances change. We know that. It's amazing what can, the difference between a Monday and a Wednesday can look like in our life. How one car decision and one turn and one career decision, one relationship decision, all kinds of things make a difference. Why does it matter that the Bible is telling us that she is a Moabite lady? It is important because the Bible is showing us that now Ruth is the foreigner. Before, it was Naomi. Now, she, Ruth is the foreigner. She talks different. She walks different. She looks different. Everything about her is different, which makes God's favor, which we're going to see here in a few minutes, even more incredible. The second thing we need to note is the timing. The Bible makes it very clear about the timing. It says the beginning of harvest season. Naomi and Ruth, they were widows with no money, with no prospects, with no connections. They, did, they didn't have any, um, really, any hope in the natural. And so the, the Bible says that it's the beginning of harvest season. And we talked about this, God's interaction and involvement in our life. Do things happen by chance or do they happen by reason? The Bible says that it's the beginning of harvest season. What the Bible is showing us right here is once again something that you and I need to be reminded of. And that is that God is always at work in our life. And his timing is always impeccable. His timing is always perfect. He is always working behind the scenes. He is always piecing together what looks like everything falling apart in our life. And we, we shake our fist at so many of the things that, that don't make sense. But God is altering and establishing what is best for you and me. And so I hope that you believe that. Now we are ready for chapter 2. Are you still with me? Yes. All right, I believe that. <laughs> chapter 2, verse 1. Naomi had a relative of her husband, a wealthy man of the clan of Elok, and whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter, do this very thing. So what's going on here? I want you to understand what we just read. Naomi says, I know a guy. He's a wealthy guy. He's a strong guy. He's a successful guy. He's a wealthy guy. And as Naomi is describing this, Ruth says, okay, I've got this one. This makes sense. If we want to eat, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go in his fields, and I'm going to glean some grain. Now, that's a word that some of you are like, what in the world does gleaning mean? Well, what Ruth is doing is, is the farmers would harvest their, their crop. They would harvest the grain. And in the middle of the field, they would leave a, a barrier, if you will. And it would be a, a kind of a crop around them. And, and, and what would happen is the, the extras that would fall off, the grain, the, the, the little pieces, if you will, that they would allow that to be left there for the poor to glean. This is what it was called. It was, it was gleaning, and, and they would come and pick this up, and that would be what they, they ate. This would be what they lived off of. And Naomi was, and you know, she was at, the, uh, at a dark point in her life. I want you to think about this. I, we, we talked about this last week about being at dark moments in our life. Naomi is at a dark point in her life. Naomi is, she is now dependent on her widowed daughter-in-law. I want you to think about this. Who is a foreigner in a foreign land, and she is sending her to some place that she doesn't know. She's sending her to some field that she doesn't know. She's sending her around a bunch of people that she doesn't know. And she's saying, listen, I hope that you can pull this together. 
I mean, this should be fun, right? How many of you are intrigued to see what happens next? <laughs> I mean, this is like watching a Hallmark movie here. Okay. Verse 3. So she set out and she went and she gleaned in the fields after the reapers. She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Moab's. Now, we need to notice something here once again. The fields of this day weren't really divided. They, they weren't really divided. They didn't have Google Maps then. They, did, they just didn't. They, they weren't signs and really good signage and brick walls that like said Boaz is farm. You know, it ain't like you were like pulling up a shoot farm, right? It was, this is, you didn't know. You were just in a massive, massive field walking around. It's like, okay, you know, this could, this could be their property, could be my property. It, they were, it, this was, it was tough. And the, the author here wants us to understand something makes it very clear. Look at this. Look at what the verse says. That she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. The author says Ruth just showed up on Boaz's part. So do things just happen? I mean, is this all by chance? Or is God at work? Verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. So here's this busy, successful businessman who hangs out in the city and has fields. He has multiple properties. The Bible goes into this. We, and history shows this guy owned quite a bit of area. He, he hangs out in the city. But he shows up in his field. The busy guy, he could be hanging out, chilling, doing his own thing, but for some reason he just so happens to show up at that field. Do you think that's just by chance? Do you think that's just by accident? I don't think so. I think there's maybe a, a little bit of God at work. Verse 5, then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is that? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and has continued from early morning until now. Look at this. The Bible says, except for a short rest. So Boaz shows up and says, who is that? Okay, let's just paint a bit. This is like the moment in the movie. Right? Where it's like the, 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 everything goes in slow motion. You remember these bars? It's like the music turns up, Taylor Swift comes on, or Twilight, the song from Twilight, you know? Hearts, pay fast. I don't you know. I'm the only one who watches TV. I have three kids. I don't have to know this. And it's like that moment, and she, it's like, you know, here he comes up, and she just looks up, rips her hair in slow, slow motion, and his sweat is going down her neck, she's been working all day, and he's just like shaking his head, and it's, okay, well, that's how I read the Bible. It's how I read the Bible, so. It's a good moment. Ladies, I want you to think about this. At, at this point, what kind of condition is Ruth in? She has been working in a dusty field all day long. The Bible says she only took a short break since basically sun up. She has been working. I, mean, I want you to imagine doing yard work all day long. All day long you've been working in mulch and a dusty field and you've been cutting things. What kind of condition are, are you in? She is dirty, she is stinky, and she is sweaty. And could you imagine, this is the moment. Ladies, if I told you you were going to meet your Boaz later today, what would your afternoon look like? I guarantee you, nine hours later, you'd be ready, right? I mean, you'd go get your mani, you'd go get your petty, you'd go get your hair done. It looked like homecoming once again, you know what I'm saying? You'd go get a spray tan, whatever you do, I don't know what you do. And you would be looking so fine, making sure that you were ready. Ruth doesn't have this opportunity. She doesn't have the opportunity to get dolled up. She doesn't have the opportunity 
to put on the makeup and to, to get the hair done and to have the right outfit and to have the right perfume. She doesn't have any of those things. What caught Boaz's eye? What was it that made her so attractive? It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't her looks. That's not it. It was her character. It was her character. It was her story. He saw a woman who would do anything she could to provide, who would do whatever it took, not only, listen to this, not only for herself, but for others, but for someone else. I mean, she not only had a re she not only was required to take care of herself, she was taking care of somebody else. And Boaz looked at her and he said, wow, that, that's a woman. That's a woman of character. That's a woman of worth. And he was absolutely attracted to her. You've heard me say there's many parts of the Bible. We just read fruit with Esther. Remember? Xerxes saw her and was like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. The Bible said it was because she was so beautiful, he couldn't stand it. He put the crown on her as fast as he could get off his throne. I mean, David, when he saw Bathsheba, he was like, good Lord. The Bible said he had to have her. He didn't care, he didn't care about the cost. Here, it's different. Go ask him. None of that stuff. No, no, no. He, he saw character. He saw integrity. He saw what matters. I hear stupid stories all the time of attraction. Anybody else hear this kind of junk? All the time. I hear it all the time. I do pre marital counseling all the time. And what, it's like one of the first questions I'll ask them is, what do you love about that person? And, I, and what they don't realize is, is I'm, I'm, I'm watching. And it never fails. It's like you, you can tell so much about what comes out next. And it's like, well, well look at her. I hear that all the time. Oh, that's what you love about her? Well, yeah, she's fine. <laughs> and I just look at her. There's these people sound like, oh, yeah, that's lovely. Guys, how many of you ever, I, 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 I like shake guys all the time because we'll have conversations and they'll be like, dude, do you know how hot she is? <laughs> she is so fine. <laughs> I don't know, don't, 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 just guys, ladies, I'm letting you in on a secret. This is how guys talk sometimes. <laughs> And when I was younger, you know, it was like, okay, that was a conversation. But then somewhere along the line, I grew up and realized what really matters. Anybody else? No? Okay, three of you are with me. Everybody else, you'll get there someday. <laughs> but I hear these stupid stories of attraction all the time. And it's like, did you see your Facebook profile pic? Yeah, I'm going after that with everything in me. She is so fine. You know what I push back all the time? All the time. And some of you guys are with me. You know what matters? Is she nice? That's like my first question. Because how many of you know it? I, how many of you would rather have a nice lady than a mean one? Okay, you can be honest. Why are you scared of it? Your sister's right next. I know. I've got a couple of sisters in here. Megan's home not to here today. Praise God. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that so many times it's like, you know, we, it, it, it's the wrong qualities that we look for. Because here's the thing. The, the beauty will fade. I can't tell you how many times I've heard guys say, she is so hot. I'm like, yeah, so is hell. <laughs> and that is exactly where you're going to be living if you go there. <laughs> Some of you get that in Samaria. <laughs> I shake people all the time because I'm like, do not. Do this. Do that beauty will fade. What you need to look for is integrity. What you need to look for is, is honesty. What you need to look for is someone who's going to get out there and pull the plow. You need to be looking and seeing if they are equally yoked, if they love Jesus Christ, if they love him first and you second, guess what? It's going to work, okay? Because what they're going to do is they're going to serve you because they're serving him. And then they're going to serve you. And look what happens, both of you are happy. You know what the problem is with so many of our relationships? One person gets this and the other one doesn't. Or you have two people that completely don't get it. And then we wonder why we're butting heads and arguing and fighting and all of this stuff. It's because we focus on the wrong things. Listen, it's, 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 it's that, that person, there are a lot of hotties out there that will make horrible husbands and horrible wives. There are a lot of hotties out there that will make horrible boyfriends and who will make horrible girlfriends. 
they will not give you God's best. I wasn't going to share this, but I'm going to share it anyway. It's just not on the screen behind me. It would have made sense if I had it on the screen behind me. But here's the thing I want y'all to y'all need to listen to me. Don't ever settle. I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about this next week, but don't ever settle. You need to wait. Some of you, maybe you need to tell somebody this, don't wait. I'll make sure this screen's up at 11 o'clock because you need to see this. While you're waiting, I don't want you to settle. While you're waiting on your Boaz, don't settle for any of his relatives. Let me tell you who they are. Broke as, blind as, cheating as, dumb as, <laughs> drunk as, cheap as, locked up as, good for nothing as, lazy as, married as, especially his third cousin beating you as, wait on your Boaz and make sure he respects you as. <laughs> Pretty good, ain't it? <laughs> this is not a PowerPoint screen, but it looks good. <laughs> we need to wait on who God has for us. You need to wait on your Boaz. Wait on them. Fill in the female word. You need to wait on your female Boaz. You need to wait on the very best that God has in store for you. You will be glad you did. Let's keep reading verse 8 and 9. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not glean in any other field. Another field, leave this one. But keep close to my young woman. Let her eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. How about I charge the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Do you see the romance here? I, I, I hope you do. I, I do. He says, hey, baby, you don't know he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't say that. He says, no more gleaning for you. You have all you need. I want you to see the first thing that he does for her. He provides for her. That's the first thing he does for her. When you, when you are with the right person, they're going to do whatever they can to provide for you. Mm -hmm. They're going to meet your spiritual, emotional, financial, physical needs in every facet. Because they don't want you to lack for anything. And they will do their very best to provide for you. The second thing they're going to do is that they're going to protect you. That's what he does. He protects her. See those young men of the other fields? They can't be trusted. That's what he says. He says, listen, so hands off. He says no one is going to harass her. No one is going to touch her. She is protected. When you are with the right person, they will do everything they can to protect you. Sometimes, that, listen, I know that means, sometimes we think that means walking around and make sure nobody's going to mess with them. No, no, sometimes protecting them is looking out for what they don't see. We get so mad at people when they step in and say, hey, you don't need to be doing this. You don't need to be doing that. But they are looking out for you. They're protecting you. And see, this is a good thing. And Boaz wasn't doing this to say she's mine. No, he was doing this to honor her because she was worthy. Let's keep reading 10 through 12. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me? Since I'm a foreigner, but Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to the people that did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done. And full reward be given to you by the Lord and the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, let's keep reading because I, I love this guy. Look at this, verse 13. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at meal time, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and had he paused to, uh, and, and to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied. And she had some left over. And when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not approach her. In other words, he says, give her what's best. Let her get what she needs and give her the very best. And also look at this blood upon the floor and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. It's good stuff. So Ruth starts off the day not knowing how she's going to eat. She starts off the day not knowing where she's going to get food. 
she finishes the day eating a, a great feast with leftovers. And actually, the Bible actually tells us for about two weeks of provision. Now, let's see how Naomi responds, and this is where we're going to stop in verse 20. So we're going to begin in verse 18. And so she took it up, and she went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she took her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, this, the man's name who I worked with today is named Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Now, this is the second mini-sermon, and it's going to take one minute. Naomi's attitude had changed, hadn't it? Remember last week we left off where she said, call me Myra, call me Bitter? That's where we left off last week. She said, I want you to, I have a new name. I want you to call me Bitter because the Lord has struck me down. He's turned his hand against me. Naomi says, I don't even, don't even call me that. I'm not even the same person. Circumstances changed, and she changed. So, chapter one, God has come against me. He has broken me. Everything has fallen apart. This week, God hasn't forgotten me. God loves me, and God has taken me, taken care of me. Isn't that funny? Last week, it was God cursed me. This week, it is God has blessed me. I think it's funny because I think it sounds a lot like you and me. How many of us kind of sound like that? One moment we're happy, one moment we're sad. One moment all is good, one moment nothing is right. Don't look at the person next to you, you're going to get in trouble. You know what I'm talking about. It's just like this, right? Well, this is what she was like, and I think this is how we are. When life is grand, God is good. But when life has fallen apart, when we're in our darkest hours, we shake our fist at God, and it's God, why have you forsaken me? God, so long as all is good, you're good. God, if everything is bad, you're bad. As long as you're happy, as long as everybody is doing right, as long as you're happy in the marriage, as long as you've got money to bank, as long as the career is going well, as long as the car is cranking, the house ain't falling apart, that all is good. As soon as something happens, we shake our fist at God. And here's the thing. We keep saying that God is in control of everything. So it's, it's how – it's so interesting because certainly you constantly. So we all admitted that last week. We all said that. Every one of us said, yes, circumstances change all the time. And circumstantial change can alter everything. Is it possible? I want you to look at this with me. Is it possible? The difference between chapter 1 and chapter 2, the difference between last week and this week, isn't God but Naomi? Is it possible? That God loved her the same in chapter 1 as he did in chapter 2. That God was still good in chapter 1. And he's still good in chapter 2. <laughs> What's the point? I think for some of us, this is where we're at. We, are at. we forget that it's not that God has changed. It's our attitude. It's our perspective. It's that. It's where we need to be in our life, where we come to the point that we say, you know what? God is good over here. God is good over there. God was good on Monday, and he was good on Wednesday. God was good on Wednesday, and he is still good on Saturday. Even though Tuesday was great and Thursday is horrible, he is still a great and awesome God. He loves us today, he loved us yesterday, and he is going to love us in the chapters to come. And so, what's the point? Maybe some of you are in a very dark moment right now. You're on, a, you're on, your, you're on your Tuesday, or you're on your Thursday. And things don't make sense. It's dark. We said God's working behind the scenes. Well, here's the thing. If God's working behind the scenes, do you know what that darkness is? It's the curtain. It's the curtain of your life. He is back there 
behind the scenes, behind the curtain, orchestrating, piecing together what needs to be pieced together so that you can receive his very best. He knows what he's doing. So, there's your two sermons. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you today for the time we've had to be here. We thank you today that you love us enough and meet us where we are. We thank you today that, Lord, not only have you spoke to us about waiting on the right one, but Lord, you've spoke to us about our attitude, about our perspective. Lord, circumstances change. We know that. But you stay the same. And Lord, like Naomi, so many of us, we, we flip-flop from chapter 1 to chapter 2. We flip-flop from day to day. Lord, may we make the decision to not do that. May we stand firm on realizing who you are and that you know what you're doing, that you're in control. Lord, today, I ask, Lord, that not one of us would leave this place the same way we came in, but we would receive what it is that you want us to hear. Lord, that you would minister to our hearts and our minds, our souls, that we would be deepened in our relationship and connection with you. Lord, have your way with every one of us this morning. Lord, we pray these things in your holy, your precious, and your